thank you for coming to this next uh, instalment in the UNRIS seminar um, series. My name is Paul Ladd. I'm the director of the UN Research Institute for Social um, Development, uh, known as UNRIST. Now, UNRIST is an autonomous research institute within the United Nations system that undertakes multidisciplinary research and policy analysis on the social dimensions of contemporary development issues. Through our work, we aim to ensure that social equity, inclusion and justice are central to development theory, policy and practice. So I would like to formally welcome our distinguished uh, members and guests of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, welcome, to present with us and then to discuss with you uh, the topic of innovation and sustainable um, development. Now, I had the pleasure of going to Beijing um, twice in the process to develop the SDGs for meetings with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the think tanks that they work with very closely on the development challenges but also opportunities that face the Chinese uh, economy, society uh, and people. And uh, what struck me was, in our very open discussions, was that uh, there was a, a very frank and full recognition of the state of development in China across all dimensions, but also at the same time uh, a tremendous sense of innovation uh, which was leading in many sectors compared with countries north, south, um, east and west. So that's why I think it's particularly appropriate that we have um, partners and peers from China today to talk specifically about the topic of um, innovation. Now the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as you'll all be aware of the buzzwords by now, is integrated, uh, universal, aims to leave no one behind. It's also both complex and necessary, given the state of uh, where we are in the world, particularly on environmental uh, sustainability, but also in terms of um, inequalities. Now, in my view, it's impossible to achieve this agenda without two things. The first is new thinking and innovation. And the second is learning from each other in all directions without any uh, misplaced uh, complacency about who has the expertise in any particular area. Now, last year, at the end of last year in UNRIST, we launched uh, what we call a flagship report, which we do every uh, five years or so, which captures the uh, best frontline thinking of our research across particular uh, our, our particular research programs and it's called Policy Innovations for Transformative Change and you, you may have seen it and if not we have spare copies um, for you, sorry, I'm picking up our institutional strategy. Policy Innovations for Transformative Change and it focuses um, more on the policy innovations and institutional innovations that countries are already putting in place because they recognise the challenges um, that they're facing. Uh, and I won't say any more about that because uh, two of my colleagues, Katya and Dunya, will start off the presentations by, by giving you uh, a sense of what's in that flagship um, report. We'll be complemented on the panel by people who will be talking also about <coughs> specifically innovation in social policy and also technological innovation and innovation in industrial uh, policy as well. Now there is a phrase, um, and I almost hesitate to say this because I'm not completely on solid ground, but it goes something like, may you live in interesting times. And uh, it's obviously expressed in English, but I think it has its heritage very deeply in um, China. And I think it's, uh, a, uh, it's a slight rather than a compliment. Um, may you live in interesting times means uh, may you be faced with some challenges that you may not ordinarily be faced with if you lived in uninteresting times. And it's certain to say that we do live in, in interesting times at the moment, where uh, facts are giving way to fiction, where evidence is giving way to ideology. And in particular, we find in the research community that that's a very tough context to work in, because funding for research is going down, funding for the UN is potentially going down, so investing in new knowledge, in finding new ways forward, and in cooperation is under threat. And that particularly affects an institute like UNRIST, which doesn't get any budget from the UN 
which mobilises each year for its resources by its work with partners and by making sure that the work it does is relevant in the international um, sphere. I think it's also a shame because it basically says if we don't invest in research we think we know it all already. And with the huge challenges that we're facing that clearly um, isn't true. So this is our small part to work against that tide. Uh, and we do so very much in the spirit of collaboration with our partners from across the world. Um, so we will start in a minute, but first um, some logistics. Um, the, I'd like to inform you that the event is being recorded. So if you missed bits or you want to revisit bits, you'll find it on our webpage um, afterwards. We're also tweeting live from the event, and people um, will also be able to send in questions uh, by Twitter. And if I could ask you please to fill in the evaluation form that you'll find at your desk afterwards because it helps uh, us refine the relevance and smooth running of all our future events. Um, so we're going to try to offer eight to ten minutes um, per person and I'm very pleased to welcome to, to kick us off uh, opening remarks from Professor Yuan Zhang who's the Director General of the Institute of World Economics and Politics in CAS. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. It's uh, really a great honor for me to be uh, invited to, to deliver uh, opening remarks for, for this uh, uh, seminar. You know, the topic we are going to uh, discuss is uh, highly relevant to uh, emerging uh, uh, developing economies in general uh, and uh, to uh, China in particular. During the past uh, four, almost four decades, uh, China has made huge achievements in terms of uh, GDP, uh, per capita GDP growth from uh, you know, 200, 200 US dollars in late 1970s. Uh, uh, to uh, about you know ten thousand US dollars today, so it's 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 a huge you know uh, achievements made made by China. Uh, apart from that, we also you know achieve a lot uh, in terms of uh, uh, poverty reduction uh, and so on so so forth. But at the same time, uh, along with uh, rapid economic growth, we encounter. Uh, or confront, confront, confront a, a number of uh, you know challenges or difficulties. Uh, for example, you know uh, a middle income trap. It's it's a buzzword uh, among uh, uh, Chinese economies today. We we are trying our best to find ways to avoid falling into the so-called middle income trap. And also we 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 have you know. Uh, 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 challenges uh, when we talk about you know the income income gap uh, inequality, just as uh, my my colleague uh, uh, mentioned, um, and at the same time, you know uh, we we have uh, you know very severe challenges. That is uh, the uh, ecological, you know, uh, or environmental uh, deterioration. Uh, it, it's becoming famous that you know China is better you know, in, in, in Beijing in particular. We experienced uh, you know small, small which uh, have already you know aroused around this dissatisfaction or even anger of ordinary Chinese people. So this is uh, you know necessary you know result of economic growth or economic development. You know people. Are keeping, you know, are, are asking for uh, these kind of uh, uh, questions. Uh, what is happening in today's China requires us to rethink about the ways to develop ourselves. We need to, you know, look at uh, the economic development in a different angle. So that's why we we you know jointly have this this seminar to discuss discuss the innovation and the sustainable development 
and from different you know angle, we we try to incorporate the social social di- dimension uh, into into our our uh, uh, mind side. Uh, social here means many things. It means you know uh, there is there is a uh, a common or shared uh, interests beyond beyond individual interests. It means you know we have to we have to work together. We have to cooperate collaborate with one with one another to achieve our individual goals. It means you know a common development or. Uh, it means you know no one can be uh, can be uh, you know happy while his neighbor or her neighbor is not. To go forward means to go together. It also means you know uh, the the justice and the fairness. It it concerns a lot with the with the relations between the government and the market. The relations, you know, with uh, uh, the relationship between the regulation and uh, self-governance at at a local level or at at a community level. So it ma- it means many things. We during the past uh, uh, forty years, we focused on the economic. Aspect economic dimension, but uh, gradually we realize that GDP is not everything. We have to, you know, uh, harmonize our relations with the environment, with our you know, ecological system. Uh, that's why we invite. Uh, two of two of my colleagues here, one from uh, Institute of uh, Sociology, the other is from Institute of Industrial uh, Economics, to present on, on innovation and the sustainable development with you know s- social dimensions. Uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences is the largest research institution in China. There are around 4,000 full-time staff. And under Chinese Academy Social Center, we call it a CAS. Under CAS, there are 40 research institutes. And my institute, the Institute of World Economics and Politics, is one of them. And my institute has 130 full-time staff, and we have already established the regular you know, a linkage with uh, foreign uh, research institute. And this is our first time to cooperate with you. Uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a very good, good start, and the, uh, I strongly hope that in the future we can you know, uh, cooperate with one another on, on you know, specific study uh, studies or research. Uh, let, let me take this opportunity to say uh, a few words about my institute. Uh, from the name of uh, the institute, World Economics and the Politics, we have uh, you know, two research, re- research groups. Uh, basically, you know, I am an economist. Uh, last year, my, is, my institute was appointed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of China as a chair of T uh, Twenty. The last year is China's uh, uh, China's T uh, uh, Twenty presidency. So under under T uh, uh, Twenty, there are a number of uh, you know. Uh, uh, engagements, Labor 20, L20, uh, uh, B20, Business 20, 
as well as you know uh, T20, uh, Think20. Uh, we established a, a network of, of think tanks all, all around the world. And we had a series of international conferences. Our focus is to you know, study, uh, study the, the ways to, uh, to make the world a better place to, to live through the global governance. So I, I strongly hope that you know we, we we can work together in the future towards that objectives. And thank you. We go into the proper presentations now, and we're going to start with um, two of my colleagues from UNRIST, uh, Kata Katya Huho, who is our senior research coordinator. She uh, coordinated our flagship report. And she'll be giving um, the uh, background to the report, uh, its main messages, and its uh, sort of conceptual framework. And then our colleague Dunya Kraus uh, will also make a presentation with some concrete examples of what we call eco-social policies, those that combine um, objectives on uh, the social side also with priorities on the environmental um, side. So we'll start with that, and then we'll go into the other presentations. So Katya. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Thank you very much to our Chinese delegation. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have you all here and to present also uh, today in a very brief form uh, um, the main purpose and, and messages and some of the content of our flagship report. Um, for us, it, it was important to publish this report in the very early time um, when the SDGs and the Agenda 2030 uh, was implemented and to give or to make our research and the evidence we are producing here uh, usable and, and practical for policy makers, for civil society and for all these actors that are now starting to implement um, the 2030 Agenda. And this Agenda is indeed um, a very, a very complex one and an ambitious one, as Paul said. Um, and it is meant to, to introduce a new global compact. Um, and um, to promote transformative change, uh, which means really to, to make things different in terms of combining social, economic and environmental objectives of development, but in a very new and, and uh, strengthened way. Um, our flagship report in this context now tried to do two things. First of all, to, to think a little bit deeper what the concept of transformation really means. And secondly, to present to our policy and practitioner audience a range of policy examples uh, that have been happening, especially in, in southern countries over the last years, and where we can take lessons and learn from for the future of implementing the new agenda. Now this is especially important in a context where we are facing a, a, a range of, of problems and challenges and we are all aware of them. Um, poverty, inequalities, crisis, health epidemics, environmental challenges, migration, flight, uh, etc. Uh, you name it. You, you are all very aware of these challenges. Um, the SDGs recognize these problems uh, and they see them as interrelated and therefore they ask for integrated solutions to tackle them. This integrated vision was already promoted very strongly at the social summit in Copenhagen. And when we think back to the time, which was the middle of the 1990s, we, we already see an important uh, turning point bringing back the social dimensions into development debates. This was very important after a time, after you know, more than a decade uh, of very strong market optimism and neoliberal uh, policy reform, where actors, countries, and also the international organizations recognized um, you know, that the social dimensions in this were missing. Now, this, the Copenhagen summit then triggered um, what we call the social turn. And the reaction was, you know, that many countries 
implemented interesting social policies and tried to combine economic and social policies in a stronger way. One of the, of the uh, in, most important initiatives, of course, were the Millennium Development Goals. Um, while this social turn was very important, uh, we also saw that it often did not go deep enough. And there are first uh, two important lessons we can learn from, from, from that period. First of all, that palliative interventions are not enough. Like what we call like the residual approach to social policy, where we try uh, to just cushion negative impacts of economic reforms. And secondly, focusing on social policy while neglecting the economics, the politics, and the environment also is not sufficient and it does not lead to sustainable and transformative solutions. Now, the 2030 Agenda gives us the opportunity to overcome these two challenges, to reinvigorate, deepen, and broaden the social turn into an eco-social turn, and secondly, to promote a more coherent, integrated, and universal agenda that leaves no one behind. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the structure of the report. Uh, it is framed around, as Paul said, uh, our main research themes and programs um, we, we have in our, uh, in our institute. And it has identified also these six policy areas as those areas that, ha that have multiple synergies and interconnected uh, impacts on almost all of the SDGs. Um, now, the, the report has chapters on social policy, care policy, social and solidarity economy, climate change, domestic resource mobilization, and finally, governance and politics, a very important chapter that really asks, so how can we make this transformative vision happen, and where does the political will and the strategies come from? Now, I also would like to say quickly that although our report focuses, as Paul said, on policy and institutional innovation, we have also tried to conceptualize a little bit the concept of innovation and to define what we mean by policy, institutional, social, technological, and conceptual innovation. And actually what we see is that all these different types of innovations are important, that often we start off with ideational innovations, conceptual innovations, but then it boils down, it comes down into a process of reforming policies and institutions, but very importantly also this needs to be accompanied by social innovations, meaning you know that communities, people, behavior is changing, social norms are changing, and this is also very important to combine with technological innovations, which are often kind of separated with the social innovations that actually are required to make them work. So what the report tries to do is to give you at hand a good understanding of what innovation is meaning and what type of innovations and interesting policy reforms uh, we are seeing around the world. And secondly, um, to benchmark policies against transformative change. So really to promote a better understanding of what transformation means. Um, and basically, um, what we try to do in studying different country cases in the report is to see whether a policy or innovation is transformative uh, uh, in the sense whether it is inclusive or democratic, uh, whether the policy design is based on human rights and part of a comprehensive and integrated strategy, and whether it uh, reflects an eco-social rational. So when we look at a reform or a policy change, then ultimately we expect transformative outcomes from these actions as long-term progressive changes in economic, social, political structures. So in particular, economic and political empowerment of disadvantaged and vulnerable groups, greater gender equality, more equal redistribution of income and wealth, greater well-being, active citizenship, greater agency of civil society organizations and social movements, changes in north-south power relations and global governance institutions, and very importantly, also a reversal of hierarchies of norms and values that subordinate social and environmental goals to economic objectives. So as you can see, this is a very ambitious definition of transformation and transformative outcomes. And basically, what we want to, uh, want to, to, uh, to make clear here is that transformative change is only happening when it is attacking actually the root causes 
of poverty, inequality, and sustainability, and not only the symptoms. Now, my colleague will give you a couple of policy examples. So I try to be short here and just tell you that in the report you find uh, uh, policy examples from over 30 countries, m very many in-depth uh, case studies actually, where we try to analyze from a very holistic perspective the different dimensions uh, of, of policy reforms that could bring us to a sustainable development. Um, and I just pick uh, two now, uh, which which are not um, uh, which which illustrate a little bit, you know, what we understand by transformative change. And the first one is a very interesting example from Uruguay, which has introduced a new care policy, um, uh, which per se is a conceptual innovation of you know seeing uh, uh, care policies in a way as an integrated system of, of very many social policies and actors that before were kind of siloed in different uh, social ministries and different social sectors. Now this uh, new care system in Uruguay was created only in uh, towards the end of 2015 and it grants to all persons with care needs, children, uh, older persons, disabled and sick persons, the right to receive care, and it considers women as the main care providers equally as rights holders. Um, it is very ambitious, not only in terms of improving the coordination of the entire social system in Uruguay uh, that is dedicated to care, but it also wants to improve gender equality and it wants to change the sexual division of labor within households because most of unpaid care is still provided by women and girls. It was very important in the case of Uruguay that women's movements and women's groups were part of the process and they consistently fought to bring in the gender equality uh, 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 objectives into this new care policy. And lastly, what I particularly find interesting as well is that this care reform was uh, linked to a uh, resource mobilization reform, a taxation reform, um, which on the one hand made this new care policy possible because it provided the resources for it. On the other hand, it also improved actually the, the uh, redistributive effect of taxation in Uruguay and therefore contributed uh, also to greater equality. The tax reform um, improved the, reduced the Gini coefficient by two points and tax revenues started to grow uh, more than 7% annually. So this provided the resources uh, actually to implement and uh, 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 this reform. Rwanda is an interesting example from, from Africa in terms of uh, reforms of the health system. Uh, and it is an innovative policy because the government of Rwanda, with all its difficulties, I always mention when I talk about Rwanda, uh, you know, it is not a perfect example. It is a developmental state, but it has its uh, its challenges with regard to um, to deepening of democratization. However, this particular health reform uh, is one example of how the the Rwanda state has leveraged community health insurance, which had a coverage of only seven percent. Uh, of the population in 12 years to almost a full coverage of the population. And this was done by designing a legal framework, implementing national standards, uh, stipulating mandatory enrollment, which is very important, uh, and also increasing both domestic funding and donor funding. When you look at the many examples we have in the report, you think a lot is happening. Um, there are a lot of eco-social policies, there are integrated policy frameworks, there are a lot of innovations, and it is particularly interesting to see how innovative have been the emerging markets, uh, the governments in the South. However, we also don't shy away uh, to, to point out what the challenges are towards transformative change, uh, where there are still gaps, um, and how sustainable these reforms actually are. So you will find also an analysis of you know, how to remove obstacles to transformative change, how to improve the vertical and the horizontal governance when implementing the SDGs, how to strengthen knowledge and evidence on eco-social policies, and a very important political economy question, how to drive this eco-social turn we are providing. <coughs> 
who are the actors, who has the power, how can we change unequal power relations and how can we design strategies that help us to achieve the SDGs. So I want to finish off with um, the key three messages of the report and summarize uh, again what I tried uh, uh, to present uh, uh, today. The first important message of the report is that combating poverty, inequality and environmental destruction requires transformative change that directly attacks the root causes of these problems instead of the symptoms. The second message is that transformative change can be driven by innovative policies that overcome the palliative and silo approaches I have mentioned in the beginning and in turn promote an eco-social turn in development thinking and practice. And my colleague will delve more deeply into the subject. And finally, innovations are transformative when they are grounded in universal and rights-based policy approaches, when they promote policy integration and policy coherence without subordinating eco-social objectives to growth and profit maximization, when they change markets so they work for society and the environment, and finally, when they lead to empowerment and accountable and effective institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, after we just heard about this uh, mysterious eco-social turn from Katya, uh, I will focus on a few examples of eco-social policies. Um, but first, we actually need to take a look at why it is we need them and um, what we think or what we mean by them. So some of you might recall this picture that made global news in 2009 as the Maldives held an underwater um, cabinet meeting to call on global me uh, leaders at the uh, Copenhagen Climate Summit to take urgent climate action. And that's basically why we need eco-social policies, because climate change is unfair. It hits those that contribute least to it the hardest. And in addition, our research found that even climate policies and environmental policies that aim to mitigate the effects can then in themselves reinforce inequalities and injustices. Because, for example, marginalized and low-income households don't have access to new technologies, or because people get displaced in the course of development planning and lose their livelihood basis without proper compensation. So what do we mean by eco-social policies and the eco-social term? It's actually a very significant shift in perspectives. One where economic activities are a means to reach equity and environmental sustainability. That's not trivial at all. It requires the prioritization of environmental and in social goals over the economic ones um, to ensure that policies respect the planetary boundaries and also promote social development. Um, and with that as a little bit of a background, let's look at some of the examples. The first one is Costa Rica, which we found a fairly, to be a fairly successful example of what we can almost call eco-social development because Costa Rica was actually among the first countries in 1997 to promote a national payment for ecosystem services scheme um, and <coughs> along this scheme that basically paid people to take on some conservation measures, it managed to take a huge turn from having among the highest deforestation rates in the world to increase the forest cover from only 17% in 1983 to 52% in 2011. Um, and this was, of course, not the only measure. The country also took a comprehensive social policy, which, uh, basically universal social policy, especially in the health sector, um, and very ambitious climate policies now. They also want to be among the first countries to go carbon neutral. Um, and they ran almost entirely on renewable energy already last year, 2016. So the progress in Costa Rica, we found, relies um, very strongly on the policy framework at the national level and the combination of economic instruments that pay people to take on conservation measures, um, specific taxes to fund this system, and then the universal social policy, as well as the promotion of active citizen participation. As, um, we also heard earlier, nobody can do it by themselves. We need to work together. And that also means national level, sub-national level, and communities need to work together to achieve a turn towards sustainable development. The second example is the Indian case Katya already mentioned. Um, it's a much simpler approach. It's a public works program um, 
that guarantees people 100 days of employment per year. And it's actually not primarily focused on sustainable development, but quite a lot share of the public works that are being um, promoted. They focus on conservation measures, on soil conservation, water uh, protection, etc. So um, this is just an example of something that might be a, a less perfect approach, but still an important innovation to promote environmental sustainability and policy. Then the next point is sustainable cities, just as one example, because many of the eco-social approaches and policies that we try to detect actually are located at the local level or sub-national level, where we see a lot of innovation. And um, cities are often called the forerunners of sustainability, even though they actually have the largest environmental impacts. But that is because they also com uh, combine a lot of innovations in, and a lot of uh, technological innovations. They, of course, have the most people in them and are the, the biggest uh, emitters so far. So in this picture, we see an example from Singapore. They're uh, called super trees. Uh, in the gardens in the bay, and these are basically 16-story high structures uh, that contain vertical gardens and that were um, installed as part of the Greening the City initiative to, um, on the one hand, promote biodiversity and improve the local climate, but then, of course, also to serve a uh, purpose of improved public health and recreation, but because they um, come with solar panels installed that feature a light show uh, at night and uh, are a big tourism uh, attraction. So we can see that this, is, of course, is a very, um, maybe a, um, something like a light tower of an example, but um, Singapore actually also has a very sophisticated approach to environmental protection. They have a water management system um, that focuses a lot on the reuse of, um, of water, of, on rainwater harvesting, and also on the desalination of seawater. Um, as you know, Singapore is a very small place. It's almost an island, and they um, don't have a lot of space. They don't have a lot of natural resources. So they are get, getting very creative when it comes to um, innovating and improving their cityscape. They still have a fairly high um, carbon emission level, but they also have plans to retrofit most buildings to um, include, like to reduce energy use a lot. They have some examples already of, of zero emission houses um, to install vertical gardens also in, in public houses and, and private buildings. Um, and here um, we can again see it's a combination actually of regulations, of also fiscal incentives, but also capacity building and consumer education. They're trying to get the whole population on board to change behaviors. They've um, installed a huge public transport system to reduce car use, for example. Um, and when we think about all these examples, they're fairly different. I mean, there are some are really national level policies, some are quite simple public works programs, and then we have a whole range of these like city examples. There are plenty of them we could think of. Um, what is important to know is that, first of all, um, there are all these efforts, and I focus now on the positive aspects of them. In all of these cases, you can, of course, still find tensions and problems. Um, but it's important uh, to to try and to study these examples to see how do we actually achieve sustainability. Because for now, we haven't found the perfect solution. We can't uh, show you the case where we say this is re really already eco-social um, and this is sustainable. Um, there are many positive examples, but uh, in many factors that contribute to the eco-social development, which we found is on the one hand this combination of public policy and local ownership, and then at the same time engaging communities and creating space for innovation and learning. That's very important. Because um, as we know, achieving the 2030 agenda will depend on identifying the right approaches and the right policy mixes that ensure the balance between environmental, social, and economic goals. Um, and um, it's important to ensure that technological innovations, which of course we need, private sector investment, which we need a lot, that also multi-stakeholder partnerships are in line with considerations of social inclusion to ensure that no one is left behind as we have signed up to as one of the key principles. So with that, I want to close. And we still want to just say um, we still need to learn much more 
about which approaches work, why, and which don't. And that requires both policy experimentation, uh, experimentation and research. Using an eco-social lens, we think, can help in identifying and understanding sustainable solutions that are both fair and green. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Paul. And uh, just like uh, Director John said, you know, it's our great player and honor to be here. I think the uh, CAS and uh, you know, uh, Eurosat has a good relationship in the past decade. Actually, my colleague, uh, Fang Lijie, uh, has been a visiting fellow here for six months last year. So, uh, CAS has two uh, institutes uh, in the fields of uh, sociology and social development. Uh, the Institute of Sociology and also the Institute of Social Development. So if you need some data and uh, uh, case from China, uh, I think we are probably the best uh, you know, uh, partner in China. So through this center, I think uh, uh, it's a good opportunity to uh, you know, learn from each other and uh, explore some possibilities for cooperation and collaboration in the future. So uh, in the China's economic growth is a miracle. Just like the uh, you know, so, so there are a lot of uh, <coughs> studies put some uh, economic policy in China. Uh, so uh, today I wanted to uh, talk about uh, another side of China's uh, economic growth. It's a social policy. Social yeah. policy actually is uh, just like two coins, uh, two sides of one coin. One is economic development, one is social development. So uh, it needs a balanced development and uh, it kind of chronic development. So the social policy in China in the last uh, four decades actually is a story about uh, uh, inclusive development. It's a story about uh, the co coordination between economic development and social development. So uh, if we divide <coughs> you know, the uh, development states in the, after the foundation of New China in 1949, I think that we can uh, categorize the development of, of social policy in China into three states. Before 1978, before the reform, as you all know, China was a socialist planned economy. Actually, there was no independent social policy. And social policy just uh, was embedded in the political and uh, social uh, you know, operation system. People this, like associate work units, you know, it's uh, not only about uh, economic unit, it's also about uh, political and social unit. So it's a kind of a, a welfare state, uh, a socialist version, you know, it's a kind of from cradle to cradle. Uh, the state cover everything for common people. So I think there's a, there's a low level of development, but there's high inclusiveness, and everybody was guaranteed a certain welfare. But uh, after the reform in 1979, you know, the, the focus of the Chinese government shifted to economic policy, economic growth. So uh, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, uh, achieve a high growth every year uh, in, the, in this kind of from 1979 to 2002. You know, the growth rate is about 10%. But at the same time, the Gini coefficient or the inequality increased to 26%. So you can say, uh, on one hand, there's uh, poor people, deep lot, but the social inequality you know, uh, widened a lot. So uh, I think uh, it's kind of a, 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 kind of a, a successful story in economic policy growth, but uh, a kind of uh, uh, not so successful or inclusive social policy. So after 2003, uh, especially after 2004, the Chinese government proposed a new idea of uh, building a harmonious society, So, which actually uh, marked the beginning of the social policy era. You know, uh, the Chinese government increasingly put focus on social, po social policy, social inequality, and the social security. So as you can see, uh, it's kind of balanced efficiency and equity. So as you can see, uh, the Gini index from 2009 to 2005 actually decreased 22%. So uh, 
so, so actually, this is kind of social talk. Actually, from the challenge case, we can learn some lessons that we need to balance social and economic development. And especially, uh, there's some limit. If you're not, if you focus too much on economic development, you will neglect social uh, equity. If you focus too much on social uh, equity, uh, there will be something like a welfare state crisis. So uh, the Chinese government just uh, learned some lesson from other countries and uh, established a uh, government, government dominated, but uh, with input from not only government, but also the market, but also from the social sector, from families. So it's kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's kind, kind of welfare pluralism, something like uh, the new, newly China in the you know, Western welfare states. So from this, uh, uh, for decades, uh, specifically speaking, there are some different categories of social policy innovation, uh, something like labor migration, poverty elevation, universal education, social security. So uh, due to time limit, I won't uh, elaborate on that. But you can see, I, I will use a part of elevation as a case to show how such policy in China works. As you can see from this chart, you know, uh, urban rural uh, residents per capita income. You know, uh, in 1978, because from 1988 to 1984, is the rural reform began first. After 1984, the urban reform, you know, uh, was launched in a large scale. So you can see at the beginning of reform, the urban rural income ratio decreased a lot. But after 1985, you know, the ratio increased again. In 1976, uh, 1996 or 1997, because the state sector was in severe crisis. A lot of state-owned employees, uh, uh, workers, was uh, employed. So the urban to rural ratio, uh, income ratio, takes again. And uh, after 2000, it's increased a lot. But uh, in 2008, after the financial crisis, because the China government switched policy, <coughs> the urban to rural uh, income ratio decreased again. As I said, you know, uh, it's a 22 percent decrease in the last uh, 60 years. So rural poverty population, because there are two kind of standards in China's um, poverty elevation efforts. It, it's not, like uh, there are absolute poverty criteria and also some, you know, it's called low income poverty criteria. So uh, regardless of the party criteria, the rural party instance in China decreased uh, you know, dramatically in the past 30 decades. Uh, it lifted the party people about, uh, you can see this from this figure more uh, clear. You can see in the past uh, uh, 30 decades, about uh, 750 million people will live out of poverty. Actually, it's, uh, China is the is, uh, only nation which realized the, the UN, uh, United Nations Millennium Development Goals in 2010. The Gini coefficient uh, figure, evolution. So, uh, so, you can see generally, the social inequality improve a lot. You know, the, the, the poor people, uh, you know, there's only about uh, 57 million poor people nowadays. Uh, uh, the, the, the poverty incidence is about uh, 5.7 this year. So, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> but with the time going, you know, the, the scenario of policy, uh, poverty changed a lot, you know. At the beginning, it's uh, area-based. The poor people are in some rural areas, in some remote and the poor areas in borderland. But now this, the causes of poverty is very complex. As you can see from this figure, 
you know, a lot of uh, different causes of poverty. Not only about, uh, you know, uh, natural resources, uh, lack of skills and education, uh, many different kind of causes, like disease, disability, education, disasters. Also, the distribution of uh, impoverished people also changed a lot. You know, uh, in the past, the people are all in certain province, or in certain count counties, imported counties. But nowadays, you can say, in Shanghai, in very rich cities, in Shanghai, also some urban poor people. In some, you know, uh, western province, like in Shanxi, there's also a lot of billionaires, a lot of, uh, you know, <coughs> rich people. So, this kind of landscape changed a lot. So that's reason, uh, another reason why we need a, a target, you know, for television program. Also, the uh, traditional party elevation policy, the Martin benefits, is also diminishing. So all these, you know, factors contributed to, you know, why Chinese government uh, launched the targeted party elevation program in 2013. So what's targeted party elevation policy? It's called the ATPE system. That A means accurate identification. With poor people, you know, there are different kind of standards. And there are people, sometimes people disagree about the who should, who is poor people. You know, why the state should give them subsidy or assistance. So, the uh, Chinese government developed a lot of uh, database to, to identify which individual and how households are uh, poor people. Also, it's got a target uh, support. Uh, it's not only about uh, physical subsidy, it's also about uh, medical assistance, education and, train education and training, and also, you know, removal and relocation. In some ecological, you know, uh, fragile regions, the government needed to remove people to other parts of the China to recover the ecology system, the ecological system. Uh, P means uh, precise management. You know, the government needed to find out the right package, what people to run the right project. Uh, also, some of assistance to this kind of uh, for people and for areas. Actually, uh, Chen Dam launched a program called uh, the College Graduates uh, Government Official Project. We send the college graduates to visit to help the co-villagers to you know, have a to uh, look at development. Also, we send some <coughs> graduates from medical schools to uh, rural areas, to rural areas uh, as a prerequisite uh, to get into some hospital as a uh, surgeon. You know, they, they, if they wanted to get the ability to, to urban hospitals, this college, the medical school college graduates needed to go to countryside first to serve for like the uh, of values to help rural, rural people uh, in many service. So there's a lot of uh, this kind of uh, social innovations in terms of uh, uh, narrowing down between the world into uh, in terms of improving many service education uh, development of poor people. Also they have elaborate assessment system. So this kind of uh, very comprehensive system uh, guarantee the effectiveness of this public uh, party innovation policy. So you can say, uh, why we, we call this innovation? Because it's uh, different from traditional party innovation program. They organize, the government organize third party evaluation projects. They also research, uh, establish some research centers on public party innovation. Also, they use uh, the latest natural te technology and big data for how to live. So, uh, especially in, in the fields of uh, e-commerce or Internet Plus, quality elevation, China actually is uh, pretty innovative. As you can see, you know, as you, can, as you uh, know, uh, the e-commerce in China is uh, pretty developed like Alibaba, like uh, Tencent, uh, this kind of uh, e-commerce companies, 
uh, shoot a lot of uh, social responsibilities. They established some program with some imported counties, imported villages to uh, to sell the local products with local fishes, something organic, organic chicken, some mushrooms, some you know kind of uh, a special kind of specialty for local uh, food to uh, make part of the cities like Beijing, Shanghai. Uh, the price actually very high, very high because the organic is from very you know the quality is very very good. So from this uh, internet or e-commerce uh, technology, you know, the poor people can get connected with the uh, outside world, with the uh, metropolitan areas, with uh, even with you know uh, foreign countries. So in China, there's uh, a lot of uh, it's called uh, e-commerce villages, e-commerce you know counties. Uh, very interesting phenomenon. So I think that through this kind of programs. Okay, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, in recent years, President Xi Jinping uh, proposed the idea of uh, the Chinese dream. Uh, in every country has dreams, American dream, European dream, but the China dream is uh, a very unique one. But uh, I think uh, there's different level, individual level, uh, national level, civilization level, uh, I don't want to elaborate on that. But uh, quality evolution is a very critical means to realize the Chinese dream. Because to realize the Chinese dream, Prime Minister Xi Jinping just uh, you know, stated uh, frequently, no people would be left, left behind. And then, the Chinese dream is for every people. It's not uh, only for you know, people from Shanghai, people from Beijing. It's also people from rural Guizhou area, from other you know, Xinjiang or Tibet. So I think this kind of uh, uh, target uh, for the innovation program is the key part of uh, Chinese policy innovations to realize the Chinese dream. Chinese dream is not only about social policy, uh, uh, other economic power. It's not only about uh, you know, technology. It's al al also about, the, as you, you said, the social and the ecological term. You know, like a beautiful China, like a cultural China. I think this is uh, very balanced and uh, comprehensive and you know, a policy regime. If you want to learn more, more about China, the Chinese dream would be the best strong point to learn Chinese poli political, uh, social, cultural, and economic forms in the next few decades. Okay, okay to, to tamarind economics, I would uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to, I think, follow on very much from uh, Mr. Zhang's presentation and look very at the role of uh, technology, specifically information and communication technologies, uh, or ICTs, as we say in shorthand, in the whole area for innovation and the SDGs. Um, I don't know if many of you know the ITU, but the International Telecommunications Union, essentially the telecommunications and ICT agency for the United Nations. We've been around a lot longer than the United Nations, over 150 years now, bringing together radio communications, standardization, and development. And one of the sort of unique uh, uh, facets of, of the ITU is that we're the only UN agency that has private sector members. And we've had those private sector members from the very first day. Um, and we work very closely with the private sector. We also have acad academic membership, and that's a, a very much a growing and evolving part of what we do. Because as you, you'll notice very much uh, in the ecosystem around the world, academia and industry is, is uh, becoming uh, almost as one in, in, in some instances. So we've, we've just started a campaign. You're actually getting a preview of it here today. We haven't gone fully public with it. We've shared it only with our members so far to give them time to digest it. Um, and by members, I mean uh, part of sector academia, but also, of course, member states. Um, and we're calling it Fast, for fast Forward, uh, uh, the tagline is Fast Forward the SDGs, but it's, it's really uh, based on fundamental belief in uh, ITU that the ICTs are catalytic drivers and essential drivers uh, to enable achievement for the SDGs. Um, if we talk about the SDG targets, uh, ICTs are specifically mentioned in four of those targets. 
uh, linked to education, gender equality. Uh, SDG 9 is a very important one for ITU because it's very closely linked to our mandate and our mission, uh, linked to infrastructure and innovation, and we want to really uh, ensure that particularly uh, broadband networks and connectivity is understood as an essential infrastructure for the 21st century digital economy. And I would say SDG 17 is also a very critical one for, well, for all of us. Uh, and in ITU, it's, it's very much uh, part of the DNA in terms of collaboration and partnerships. And we would see uh, innovative collaboration as a, an essential uh, ingredient in achieving uh, the SDGs. But I'll come to that later. Um, so just to look at, at how ICTs can practically impact uh, you know, at the human level, at the societal level, uh, progress in, uh, in sustainable development goals. We've put together a number of case studies and we have a, a, a website which you, you can visit via our homepage uh, under the, the sort of hashtag ICT for SDG. Um, but we've put together a lot of different case studies on how um, once there is affordable access uh, to connectivity, to ICTs, uh, that it opens up a world of opportunities and possibilities for, uh, for everybody, for all, for all citizens, be they from uh, uh, least developed, uh, developing or developed, developed uh, society, developed countries. Um, so in, in this particular case, uh, linked to the, the Ready for Reading uh, platform, which immediately brings some almost 40,000 uh, books to, uh, through a smartphone to children in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so there has been a number of, of progress on SDG 4 linked to quality education, but uh, there are challenges. Um, many countries are, are lagging behind. We still would say we face a challenge very much in convincing beyond our own constituencies the importance that technology and ICTs play in driving the sustainable development. So we're putting a big emphasis and we're working with UNESCO on that through the UN Broadband Commission and many other partners um, in reaching out to uh, ministries of education for instance. So last year in in Paris with UNESCO, we had the first ever roundtable between ministers of education, global roundtable between ministers of education and ministers of ICT or telecommunications. Uh, last year, also here in Geneva at the World Health Assembly, we had the very first roundtable with ministers for health and ICT. So we're really, really trying to uh, demonstrate through evidence and through through partnerships uh, the importance of ICTs to drive uh, progress in all of these different uh, SDG areas. Um, I'll, I'll move through the, in the interest of time, I'll move through the, the PowerPoint, but it will be available uh, on, on the website. But we have a lot of data in ITU. We have a, we're the global repository for, for data when it comes to ICTs and uh, connectivity and communication, be it internet, mobile, fixed line, what have you. Um, and we have, a, we have a lot of uh, interesting information on the, 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 the role of technology when it comes to uh, education, be, be it in terms of learning or uh, connectivity to different educational platforms. Um, and if you can see from this color-coded uh, chart, the, there is still quite a, a digital gap that needs to be addressed, and this is something that we are certainly working on at ITU and with our partners in the Broadband Commission as well. In the area of gender equality, um, this is very much a, a, a central uh, issue at the ITU and I think across many UN agencies and indeed the new UN Secretary General uh, highlighted it as one of his main uh, priorities, uh, gender equality. So the, the technology uh, sector is one that uh, um, unfortunately suffers from uh, quite a significant uh, gender divide um, and that's something that we're really addressing. We have a, a new campaign called Equals which is working with industry and governments to really try and address this at a number of levels, uh, particularly looking at uh, uh, access to technology, uh, digital skills and leadership, the role of women in not just uh, creators or producers of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of technology and applications and services, but as entrepreneurs and as leaders in, in the whole sector. Um, so this is one, an example, a case study of one of our partners, telecenter.org, where we've managed to train over one million uh, women uh, in digital skills and then following up with all sorts of different mentoring 
uh, services to uh, encourage uh, um, employment or entrepreneurship in the ICT sector. Um, in in the, the SDGs specific to, to gender equality, um, and if we relate it to, uh, to the areas of concern for ITU, you'll see there are quite uh, important gaps across the different areas, be it access to mobile phones, access to the internet, or whatever, and in, in, ter in, in our annual uh, measurement, we have an annual report, it's our flagship report, I guess, called the Measuring the Information Society, it comes out every October. Um, this year, uh, or actually, well, la we worked on last year's data, um, it actually identified a growing gap in the gender divide when it comes to uh, access uh, and usage of technologies. So that's something we, we want to urgently address, and um, we're working with the likes of GSMA, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, all of our member states, etc., um, through the Equals Partnership on, on, um, uh, on this issue. Um, on the SDG 9, um, our colleague Dunya talked about sustainable cities and in ITU we, we have uh, something, we used to have smart cities and now we have smart sustainable cities. Um, and it's a it's very uh, important framework for a lot of our work. If, you, if, you, if, you, if we start to reimagine the work of ITU, areas such as uh, intelligent transport systems, green energy, uh, even cloud computing, digital finance, mobile money, e-education, e-government services, you can go on and on, um, can all fit within the, the vision of a future smart sustainable city. So we have specific study groups on this and in ITU the way we work, we work in study groups where we bring all of our members and experts together to develop standards and, and policies that enable, uh, enable change and drive change. Um, so the, the smart cities area is one that's extremely important for us um, and covers many, many different uh, areas from health to energy to, to finance, etc. Um, there has been uh, some progress in this area, um, but there, there are still a lot of challenges and I think one of the, the big challenges, and we'll be addressing this in Davos uh, on the 17th of January um, in a special session of the Broadband Commission together with the World Economic Forum on looking at uh, innovative investment models to achieve the global rollout of broadband networks because that's the fundamental infrastructure we need in place if we're to really leverage connectivity to drive uh, progress in achieving the SDGs. Um, we have different case studies, uh, uh, many, many different case studies on how uh, member states and, 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 and public-private uh, uh, partnerships are working to, to, to um, infrastructural projects. I have some examples here um, from, from Malaysia and Myanmar and Bhutan. Um, these are all available in our, in our Measuring Information Society report and in the Broadband Commission State of Broadband report every year. Um, we have something in, in the Measuring the Information Society report called the IDI, that's the ICT Development in Index, where we look at a whole range of indicators, be it access to fixed line, mobile, digital skills, um, support for startups, etc. And we, we have a, a, a measurement then, which, which we, an index which we release every year. So you can see here there's still some quite uh, disparities um, when it comes to uh, sort of the, the global benchmark for uh, measuring ICT development. Um, you can see below the world average there, there's still a lot of, of uh, progress and, and catching up which is needed in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the Arab states and Asia and Pacific as well, which is while well, you have m many parts of Asia and Pacific that have very high levels of connectivity and indeed the, the highest level, uh, the highest speeds in the world are in Asia, um, but there's also the largest population of uh, people who do not have access to the internet because of a lack of uh, uh, connectivity, be it linked to affordability or uh, geog geography. So these are areas which are being identified by ITU and the Broadband Commission to, to really prioritize to try and uh, speed up the, the number of, uh, to connect the unconnected. Um, so coming back to SDG 17, um, the, the whole area of, of partnerships, um, 
One of the areas that we've worked on in the Broadband Commission is to work with governments to develop uh, national broadband plans and uh, digital agendas. So already we can uh, happy to say that uh, over 151 countries have a national broadband plan. This needs to be constantly supported and renewed. Um, but very important, and I think even in many countries, including my own in Ireland, uh, becoming quite a, a political potato. Uh, I mean, uh, the governments are, are really putting this at the top of their agenda and working across different sectors, um, be it rural, agriculture, uh, health, education, etc., to ensure that, uh, that everybody has access uh, to the digital economy or else uh, their, their economic survival, if you're a small, medium enterprise, for instance, will certainly be, be threatened. Um, so in, in the actual partnerships for the SDGs itself, um, we have a lot of data that uh, showing there are substantial differences, not just between developed and developing countries, but within specific regions. Um, and we've all, all of that is documented, so that's another digital divide that, that we need to look at, uh, not just globally, but regionally and also within countries. And we have all, we have all of that mapped, uh, it's, it's, it's available online uh, for anybody to access and share. So that's something, again, linked to what we'll be doing in Davos and linked to, to our ongoing work that we're working on with private sector um, and other partners from civil society and academia to try and, and, and speed up the quality uh, uh, connectivity through public-private partnerships through more innovative collaborations. Um, here is a sort of a breakdown of, the, of the, uh, the disparity between the regions when it comes to digital divide issues. Um, so just to move uh, quickly towards um, partnerships uh, with, with governments, um, some some uh, concrete ideas of, of what's been what's of what's happening at the moment. Um, streamlining ICT sector policies through digital agendas is something that's uh, very much at the at the top of our uh, of our priorities. A an area that's becoming increasingly important, not just for private sector but for governments, is supporting uh, startups and what we call MSMEs, or we don't call them. That's a, a term, the micro SMEs. Um, where you know all the evidence is showing that these are extremely important for uh, economic growth, for new job opportunities, for, for digital natives, etc. But of course, again, uh, fundamental that they have the, the, the broadband infrastructure they need to survive and thrive in a global digital economy. Um, different partnerships and case studies we, we, we're collecting all the time in terms of uh, what's happening out there in, in the different areas of health. Uh, agriculture, finance, uh, education, etc. Um, and in, in, on the academia side, uh, quite a lot happening and also here in Geneva, University of Geneva and others are, are becoming very uh, involved in the whole area of the SDGs through, through their research and partnerships. So we have a whole list of areas here listed out and that we're currently working on with academia. Um, it ranges from policy and regulatory, re regulatory reform to the connected car, uh, to e-waste, and to digital finance, which is, a, which is really a potentially major game changer for poverty reduction and, uh, of, of course, uh, digital economy issues. Um, uh, given the time pressures, I'll, um, I'll skip past the, the final case studies there. But just to summarize, uh, just to summarize what we've been quickly presenting this morning, um, we really believe that ICTs are, are, and all the evidence shows and is widely recognized now, that they are essential catalytic drivers in enabling all the SDGs. Indeed, David Navarro, the, the SG's special representative, said he believes without ICTs, the SDGs cannot be achieved. Um, they're specifically re referenced in those four SDGs that I mentioned, but essential for, for all of, of the SDGs. And then in, t in terms of the innovative collaboration that, that, that's typically needed, uh, uh, I would highlight a couple of areas, uh, not exhaustive by any means, but in investment models for the global rollout of broadband networks. I mean, everybody agrees we want global connectivity, but we need to know how we're going to pay for that. Uh, policy making is absolutely essential to create an enabling environment for investment, for, uh, for flourishing uh, SMEs, etc. 
the research and data to inform policy making, making to narrow the digital and gender divides, and that's areas that we're, we're working on very, uh, very much at the moment. More support for innovation, especially with regards to SMEs, startups, and support for digital skills to drive the digital economy in emerging economies and greater advocacy on the positive contributions of ICTs and connectivities to verticals such as health, ag, education, um, as well as the global challenges such as poverty reduction and climate change. Thank you very much. I'm yeah, very honored and pleased to be here to be the last one of this seminar. And my topic is uh, about China's industrial innovation for sustainable development. And as we know, there are 17 goals for the 20 and 30 goals, and the, among the 17 goals for the, uh, the goal 9 is about the uh, uh, industry infrastructure and innovation. More detailed is it about uh, developed infrastructure support economic development and human being, including the ICT infrastructure. And uh, the second is about uh, inclusive and sustainable uh, industrialization, and third is uh, SME development. And the fourth is a clean production, environmentally friendly uh, technology and processes. And finally, it's about uh, to uh, upgrade industrial uh, technological capabilities to for a long-term uh, development. And my topic, uh, my presentation covers two parts. And the first part is to I'd like to share you some uh, show you the, the story about China's industrialization and its effects on SD SDGs and its unsustainability in the traditional industrial pattern that we are facing some uh, risks and, and uh, uh, challenges. And finally, I would, I'd like to share you China's new plan for, to, to foster a new uh, development, uh, industrialization pattern. It is based on innovation driven. And as we can see in this figure, the red dash is the uh, growth rate of very early of secondary industry. And the blue line is the growth rate of, of GDP. And we can see there is a very strong uh, connection between these two, uh, two, two uh, time series data. And the coefficient is as high as almost 0 0.9. That means China as a developing country. China has been following an industrialization driven growth model pattern since 1917. Eight. And uh, so, and the, here are some main achievements about China's industrialization related to SDGs. Firstly, is about their employment. As we can see on the left finger, uh, it, it is about the employment by three stress of industrialization, and the red is the number of employment in the secondary industry. And we we can see very clearly on the on the uh, on the right figure. The employment in the secondary of industry, both the number of employment and growth and portion of uh, employment in the post population has uh, grown very fast uh, during this uh, the process of industrialization in the, uh, uh, in the past four decades. And the number of secondary industry uh, employment grew from uh, 70 million in the late of 1970s, and in the, uh, today is about is more than 200 million. In 2005, more, intu more intuitively, the Chinese worker, the uh, number of Chinese worker, uh, industrial worker, is 2.8 times of German total population and uh, uh, 1.8 times of Japanese population. It's a very big uh, uh, number of industrial workers in China, and it is about half of the EU total population. And the secondary is about urbanization. And China's industrialization is a process by transferring people from poverty or poor, less developed and rural regions to cities, get jobs, and, and uh, to start a new life in urban, uh, in urban uh, re regions. As we can see in this, fig in this figure, the, the blue is the index of industrialization uh, calculated uh, uh, by scholars in my institute, and the, the red is the urbanization red. And we can see the higher of the, the the level of industrialization, and there is also a higher level of urbanization. So industrialization is a very uh, strong driver of urbanization. And third is about the income. This figure shows the uh, average uh, wage uh, of the worker in manufacturing sectors uh, since 2000, uh, 2003. And the growth rate, annual growth rate, is more than 10% in their uh, average wage. Mm. So China's uh, industrialization is also contribute to the income growth and profit reduction. And thirdly, is about the 
reshaping the, uh, the global and regional production patterns. As we can see in this figure, the red line is, is China's uh, intermediate goods imports in electronics and automobile industries. And we can see that China uh, grew very fast in these sectors. And compared to other East Asian uh, economics, uh, including Japan, Korea, and Singapore, and Thailand, uh, that means uh, China, China's industrialization uh, import a lot of imports, uh, uh, intermediate goods from other regions, and it, it will affect global production network and relate to the trade partners and FDIs. And, f and, f and the fifth is innovation. As we can see in different uh, indicators, uh, China's large and the medium-sized uh, industrial enterprises and enterprises are seeking the uh, very area of innovation. For example, their R&D expenditure and patent applications, sales of experts of new products, and uh, R&D expenditures uh, in high selected high high tech manufacturing industry are growing uh, in the past uh, years. And six is the technological technological capability. Uh, which is reflected in China's uh, export structure. There, we can see that in, for the SICT7, it is about the machinery uh, sector, it's a uh, technological intensive sector. China is, is moving, uh, is growing in the uh, in China, uh, industry trade, that means China is growing up in the global value chain. And finally, it's about the emission uh, reduction. And we can see uh, in this figure, since uh, 2004, the emission of SO2, that is the uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, and the NOx, uh, decreased uh, a lot uh, in the in the past uh, few years because of China is uh, is enforcing stricter environmental regulation <coughs> policies. And in general, uh, as a developing country, China has China's industrialization contributed to some of SDGs, including the employment, poverty reduction, innovation, and urbanization, etc. However, there are uh, there are also some unsustainable risks. And uh, firstly, is about the unsustainability, unsustainable uh, competitive advantage. As we can see on the left figure, it is about dependent uh, uh, ratio. Since 2010. The dependent ratio uh, start to increase. That means uh, that means the uh, China is facing the challenge of disappearing demographic development and the decreasing uh, labor supply and fast growth in the uh, labor cost. This is the, the uh, you can see from the the right, the right figure. So China as a world factory uh, of uh, a world factory now China is an aging world factory and. Uh, so China may be the, facing the uh, risk of diminishing uh, competitive advantage of cheap laborers. This is the top one uh, risks. Uh, the second is about the industrial innovation uh, mechanism. As we can see uh, in this figure, the blue line is China's uh, national R&D intensive. It is uh, exceeded 2% in uh, 2014. Uh, that means China is reached the middle level of innovative country. Uh, but uh, in China, for the industrial innovation uh, intensity, it is still less than 1%. That means uh, China is still very weak in the industrial uh, innovation. Uh, if we compare the R&D intensity with developer, developed economies, the gap is even much more uh, remarkable. And third is about the overcapacity. And here are some selected industries, uh, yeah, such as the uh, cement, coal, and the ship grasses and steel. And in the past few years, the utilization of the capacity is less than, is about uh, 70%. Uh, that means there is a very uh, low efficiency in this industry for the uh, uh, utilization of the factors of production. And there are also uh, some zombie enterprises in these sectors. That means they rely on the financial uh, support rather than their profitability in the market. And uh, these industries are uh, highly uh, resource consumption, highly prudent. And uh, uh, if these uh, sectors, uh, the old capacities cannot be uh, adjusted uh, very effectively, it will be a huge uh, cost for China's industrialization patterns. And the third is about the ecological system burdens. And we can see, uh, based on the statistics, the water pollution and the air pollution 
is still increasing in the past few years, and the industrial pollution is a very uh, big source of these pollutions. And uh, the third figure is about the daily AQI, that is air quality index of Beijing in 2006. And we can see that uh, only a very small portion of the days, the air quality is as good as the uh, Geneva. As we can see, the, the green the green zone is very low. That means uh, a very high, uh, good uh, air quality. And under these uh, unsustainabilities, including the unsustainable comparative advantage, economic, uh, eco ecosystem burdens, industrial innovation weakness, and overall over capacities, China need to find new solutions uh, for the industrialization uh, uh, transformation, uh, including the uh, to uh, increase the compar competitive advantage uh, in different ways, decoping the uh, industrial expansion and industrial pollution, and uh, to uh, to uh, foster innovation capabilities and to make market system much more efficient to deal address the problem of of capacity. So China is, China's industrialization is at a close lock. And uh, among others, in last, uh, last year, China has, uh, uh, has uh, adopted a new long-term policy that is named the Made in China 2025. Uh, the general direction of China's industrialization uh, transformation is to, is to trans transfer into uh, higher productivity sectors, as we can see. Uh, Oh, sorry, it doesn't work. And, uh, some of the this is a pen factory in Zhejiang, and uh, visited in March last year. Uh, still, many of the works are, are done by hand, by, by the women's hands, to pull to to and and in the other part they use some machines to use automation. Sorry, to to uh, increase the productivity. And the secondary, this is a, a, a tissue factory. It's a very dangerous. You need to cut tissues into uh, different uh, slides. Uh, there is a very, uh, their, their lives uh, just near the, uh, the worker's hand. And it's very dangerous. And the inside, and now some of the factories are using the ro other robots to replace the hand, uh, human, human hand. And uh, clean production, this is a, a my refraining process is very dirty and pollution and pollution. And this is a, a different a, in a textile factory. Uh, it used a uh, very clean technology. And this is a, a, a textile clothes factory. They use some uh, very, very uh, low value. And here are some advanced uh, machinery uh, industries, such as the TPM. The China's high speed rail in Changchun, and this is the power generation and power generation uh, manufacturing. And here are some new materials. And under this guidance, and China has made some quantified targets for uh, sustainable uh, industrialization. Uh, here are some selected growth, such as they have we have uh, made some targets for 2020 and 2025. Uh, including the IMD intensity, the uh, broadband penetration, and digital IMD, and, uh, and the other uh, targets to integrating the information, informatization, and industrialization. And I also made some uh, targets for uh, green development, including the reduction of energy consumption, uh, re reduction of CO2 emission and water consumption, and uh, to uh, the to utilize the industrial solid waste, and uh, uh, the next question is how to fulfill uh, these targets. And China has made a new task uh, in this plan, that including the innovation capability building and the integrating information te uh, technology and, and industrialization to uh, enhance quality and brand of Chinese products and promoting green production process uh, breakthroughs in some. Uh, Priority sectors and to uh, to make China's industrialization much more open to the world, to the world. and around these new tasks, and China also have a very detailed uh, 
tasks to fulfill these new, uh, these new objects. Uh, it's for example, to strengthen the, the, uh, the innovation uh, capabilities, including to build an innovation system at the industrial uh, level, and to increase fundamental R&D uh, expenditure, and to increase China's uh, capability in designing. And for example, to, uh, another example is to uh, promoting uh, green production, including the greenizing process of production, and the resource recycling plans, and the life cycle green production system need to be uh, built up. And uh, sorry, because of the time uh, limits, I cannot explain four of the new targets in details. And in general, the China, is, uh, China is transforming from a resource input driven industrialization to a much more innovation uh, driven uh, industrialization. That is to need to build a new uh, innovation, national innovation systems and uh, industrial innovation systems. To fulfill this target, China needs to make a lot of uh, efforts in institutional innovations. For example, uh, to uh, the firm uh, in some of the institutions that will uh, underplay the efficiency of the market. Uh, China needs to build a fair play market system for both the big enterprises and SMEs and uh, to have some support for SMEs in particular and uh, to uh, renew the training systems for the people maybe shifted from the, uh, some traditional industries to uh, emerging industries. And uh, if this is, will be worked successfully, work very successfully, China will be a rich and sustainable industrialization and innovation. That is the target of the, uh, uh, of the, the nice target of the 70s targets. So this is the, uh, something I'd, I'd like to share with you. Thank you very much. It's my privilege to uh, bring this seminar to a close. Uh, firstly, I, I, uh, I want to thank the organizers, uh, especially uh, and Misty, how do you pronounce Misty, and, and Cass, uh, to have such a uh, successful and very uh, fruitful seminar. Without their great efforts, I think uh, we have no such a uh, good uh, opportunity to exchange our views. And uh, I also want to thank uh, the presenters uh, and the discussants and uh, also uh, all participants. I think uh, from our uh, Moment, I think we uh, get very uh, insightful results about you know, our knowledge about the, the development. Frankly speaking, I'm, I'm not a sociologist, I'm an economist, but I learned a lot from uh, uh, this seminar. It uh, broadened my vision about uh, development uh, because, you know. Uh, uh, I just focus about the uh, economic development, especially about the GDP growth and you know, uh, some government measures. But uh, from this seminar, I find that that's not enough. And also, uh, this seminar uh, provides the, not only the, the world experience, but also the China's case about the social development. So here, I just want to say uh, something about China's experience to deal with the social development. Just now, my uh, uh, two colleagues uh, talked about uh, you know, the poverty and reduction of poverty, and also uh, the industrial innovation policy. Here, I, I just want to uh, say some points some rest, about, uh, you know, uh, one is that about, you know, even so China's uh, growth you know, experience a uh, very high speed in the past three decades. But, you know, the social well-being does not keep the same pace with uh, GDP uh, capital growth. So today, the people, I mean, the common people, they do not just concern about their income, but also, who may be, they are more concerned about their social well-being. For example, they're concerned about the blue sky, the clean air, the social security, their freedom, their dignity. I think that's most important because the common people think the social 
you know, that's back to those three dimensions. <coughs> It's so important now. So the government, same government, also, uh, you know, put up some new development package for for China's, you know, the future. Uh, for example, we uh, put up some new ideas about development, uh, the green development and the inclusive development. I think that's very important. It's not just kind of idea, but also we. Uh, implement, you know, fundamentally including in China. And the second uh, I want to uh, say is that when we talk about the social development, especially when we talk about the social development and the economic development, we have to find that the innovation is a good thing, but at the same time, it's a kind of disruptive, a creative structure. Is that should that should be telling they just should they can't to be telling growth. That means if we encourage you know the innovative firm, they can you know win in the market, but some other firms they will fail. They have to exit from the market. That means the innovation can cause lots of bankruptcies, can cause lots of unemployment. So how to deal with these unemployed workers. So in China, we propose, we have to implement such social protection policies to have a social safety net to protect the unemployed workers. But today, in China's, you know, such kind of social safety net is not good. So why does lots of zombies, zombie firms exist in China? Because we cannot let them, you know, go bankruptcy. If we let them go bankruptcy, then lots of unemployed workers, they have no, you know, social protection and that will cause social problems. I think that's, you know, the very important social aspect about the development. About the innovation. And the last point is that in China, just because of the situation and also the local governments, you know, in the past three decades just focus on GDP growth and then just a lot of, you know, uh, problems occur. For example, the over capacity, the, you know, the, the, the environmental uh, destruction and the lots of, you know, uh, social problems. So today, we use new performance game evaluation system to assess, you know, the local government's performance. We use, uh, you know, the social aspects about their performance. For example, does, you know, the local government provide, you know, social security, education, and, uh, uh, you know, the health system, and also, you know, the you know, the, 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 the blue skies. I think that's most important to change such kind of, you know, <coughs> evaluation system. If we can do that, I think the social development will be better, uh, uh, will be better. And finally, uh, I would say this seminar inspired and uh, deepened our thinking about uh, social development, which will make our world better, not only for our planet and the natural, you know, the nature, but also for our